I want to begin this morning by offering thanksgiving and praise. It's, uh, first of all, wonderful to have so many people here today, to have you here. Thank you for joining us this Easter weekend. I want to thank uh, Bev Bell and the musicians of the church for rehearsing on a Friday night and bringing us some great music, and for our orchestra uh, showing um, playing with our hymns. I love that. If you play an instrument, uh, you, I have no, no way, n- no leverage over you to get you to share your talent. That's the sad thing. I'd like to threaten you. I'd like to cajole you. I'd like to tell you God is going to, uh, you know, catch up with you on. I, I can't. It's theologically inaccurate, and I just, there's no leverage I have on you except to say, if you play an instrument, bring it. It's so wonderful what it adds to our worship. I'm grateful for that. I want to thank V.J. Perry for the beautiful bulletin design today. Uh, We do an extraordinary job, well, she does and Travis does, with these kinds of things, and it makes our worship interesting and special. So thank you, V.J., for that. And she and Brett, I think, did most of the lilies, too, in decorating here today. So gratitude for that as well. Thank you for all of you who who donated a lily uh, this season to, to make our church bright and uh, welcoming. I'm grateful most of all to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who gives us hope in this season uh, even as we celebrate on this Sabbath day. As you can probably tell, it's, it's not quite resurrection time, at least in my mind. Tomorrow uh, is, is going to be that day. And so I want to focus on what it means to us when the light has gone out of the world. Because we don't just experience that when we think about the death of Jesus. We think about that when we're in tough times and in situations of great loss or pain ourselves. I I know you can quickly think of them with me, but I mean, what comes to mind immediately is the loss that we feel when someone very dear to us has passed. In that moment, it feels like the light has gone out of the world. All we can see is that loss and the pain of it and the darkness that seems to accompany it. A good number of you, if statistics hold, even though we're Christians and even though we have faith, a good number of you suffer depression. And if you are suffering depression, you could tell me a little bit about what it looks like to have the light go out of the world. In those dark moments when you are not sure what is next or how you're going to get through or perhaps, hopefully not, but perhaps even if life is worth living. In those moments of darkness, it doesn't seem as if the light will ever shine again. It doesn't seem as if hope could ever creep back into your world. And thank God it does and it can. But you know something about what it's like when the light goes out of the world. When we have a a national tragedy or something on a global scale takes place that rocks us, It feels like, for a time, the light goes out of the world. I don't know when the last event in this country of that magnitude was for you, but I think probably, I think back to 9-11 and the way I felt as I watched those towers come down. There may be more recent events that you can cite. Sometimes it's very local. It's a matter of something that happens in a city or in the path of a tornado. But we go through things that make us think the light has gone out of the world. For some of you, it may be a diagnosis. Everything was good, life was great, you just got a promotion, a raise, your marriage was going better than ever, you had just bought the car you had wanted to buy for years, and you've gone to the doctor and you have stage 3 cancer. And all of a sudden, the light has gone out of the world. Worse, everything is going along just fine, and something happens to your child. And the light has gone out of the world. I don't bring all this up to leave you in a state of great depression this day. I just bring this up because... 
When Jesus died, the light went out of the world for his mother and his disciples and his friends, but it also went out of the world in the most deep and spiritual way possible. All in that moment, hope for humanity felt lost. In that moment, everything seemed dark. So today we're just going to talk about what that looks like and feels like and the hope that comes with the light after the darkness. I'm going to go through our text that we read this morning backward. Thank you to our readers, the Wizard family. That was fun. I'm going to start with the gospel text and work my way backward through those that were read. Jesus spoke again to the people. He said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, Jesus is speaking, I think, on a number of levels. As creator, he's the one who speaks and light is formed, yes? As the one who thinks of uh, the eye and its function of receiving light and the signals that bounce off of light and the way in which we perceive objects, when he speaks of light in the eyes, he's speaking not only of life that we have and vitality, but he's speaking of perception and spiritual goodness, that which is infused into us. It's both literal and metaphoric. So when he says, I am the light of the world, he means this on multiple levels. He means that he is spiritually the way, the truth, the life, and the light. If we follow Jesus, he assures us, we will never walk in darkness, never, but will have the light of light. Now, that's not to say that the psalmist is wrong and we won't walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That is not to say that like Paul and all of Jesus' disciples, we won't have sufferings and trials and tribulations. That is not to say we, like Jesus at moments, will not cast our eyes heavenward and say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As you know, if you know me at all, and some of you are new and don't know me at all, I'm not much of a Pollyanna, to give you a very old reference. I like the glad game, but I'm also something of a realist. People suffer. Life is hard. We face setbacks. And the appropriate emotional response to that isn't sunshine. We feel pain and doubt and upset and darkness and we labor through that in our relationship with God in the light of his path as we move back into health and wholeness in whatever arena we're talking about. The psalmist illustrates that well for us over and over again. So here I am all the way to verse 13 now. The Pharisees challenged him, here you are appearing as your own witness, your testimony is not valid. I find this to be incredible because if the Pharisees had known who Jesus was, they would have known that he was also the bread of life, referring not only to manna in the wilderness, but the broken bread of his body that was to come. And they would have known that he was the water from which no one would ever thirst if they drank. Jesus answered, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is, not, is valid, for I know where I come from and where I'm going. You have no idea where I come from or where I'm going. You judge by human standards, and I pass judgment on no one. But if I do judge, my decisions are true because I'm not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. In your own law, it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is true, is true, I am the one who testifies for myself. My, fa my other witness is the Father who sent me. And then they asked, where is your Father? Doesn't it make you want to roll your eyes? About this time, I want to roll my eyes back in my head and start to get very sarcastic. That's because I'm not Jesus. I have a ways to go, apparently. That was a joke. I've got a long way to go. 
You do not know me or my father, Jesus repeats. If you knew me, you would know my father also. He spoke these words while teaching in the temple courts near the place where the offerings were put, yet no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. Once more, Jesus said to them, I'm going away and you will look for me and you will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. As that passage ends, there's not a lot to look forward to. Jesus is coming and going to places we're not sensitive to and know not. To a father we haven't listened to or understood. A father he's revealed. And now we will die in our sins. And where we go, where he goes, we cannot come. I think he's actually not referring, though, to you and I. I think he's referring to those who had not the light in their eyes, who could not see the spiritual reality, who couldn't understand that he was the one sent to the Father full of grace and truth. I think he was really referring to something about those who could not see, those who doubted and could not believe, those who saw but would not accept, refused to understand, refused to believe. Jesus makes it clear. He is the light of the world. And if we're ever going to get through the dark times that we experience, we have to hold on to that, knowing that if we continue our journey with him, in him, through him, beside him, we will pass from darkness to light, never more to be in darkness. Our other gospel reading found in Luke is taken from the crucifixion scene. It's Friday about noon. He's been on the cross roughly three hours. He'll have time yet before he breathes his last and says it is finished. The text is poignant, and the point that I want to make comes in this first verse that we read, though... The whole is valuable. Verse 44, it was now about noon. Only Luke records this. And darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. For the sun stopped shining. We read that when Jesus died, the earth quaked. The sun quit shining. It turned dark. It wasn't just an event of a man who was innocent being crucified between two guilties. It wasn't just another senseless murder in the Middle East. It was an event that rocked the world. It was an event that ushered in a darkness so penetrating, so deeply spiritual, it made people afraid to their bones, to their core. When he breathed his last and said it was finished, the earth itself responded. We know this is part of the spiritual message Jesus gives, doesn't it? Because as he's coming into Jerusalem, he says, if the people don't speak out, the stones themselves will cry out in testimony. If the stones themselves have a testimony, what might it be? In this moment of darkness, we have no choice but to stand or sit and remember. The light will not yet come. His life is to be gone and our hope and joy with it. The sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, and breathed his last. It was a centurion seeing this who praised God, a Gentile, a Roman. Surely this was a righteous man. And when all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they were convicted. They beat their breasts and went away. Do you remember the prayer of the unworthy and the proud man? 
The proud man stood in the corner and said, Oh God, I thank you that I have money, that I'm a man, and that I'm not a Gentile. I thank you that I rock. And the humble man beats his breast and says, Lord, have mercy on me. Mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus assures us that one man left that sanctuary renewed and another stuck where he had been forever. The people who saw Jesus die that day beat their breasts. Lord, have mercy on us, for we have killed a righteous man. But all who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. Ladies of the church, take heart. Not only are you the majority in almost every church in America, but you didn't run when the crucifixion happened. The men left, the men scattered, but the women stood and waited and watched everything that took place. They were there to tend to Jesus in his dying hour and to his last breath. Let it never be said that women are unfit for ministry or for leadership or worship. For women stood when men ran. Now there was a man named Joseph a member of the council and a good and upright man who had not consented to their decision and action. He came from Arimathea, and he himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. He asked for Jesus' body, took it down, wrapped it in a linen cloth, and placed it in a tomb cut in a rock in which no one had yet been laid. It was preparation day, and Sabbath was about to begin. The women who came who had come with Jesus from Galilee, followed Joseph and saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. And because Sabbath was about to come, they waited to prepare his body, even though they had spices and burial things ready for him. Isaiah is prescient when he speaks in Isaiah 53. Many times we read this as a messianic prophecy and we read it around Christmas time, looking for the coming Messiah who would bear our pain. But it's appropriate this season too. Listen to the words that Isaiah uses. I'm going to say them first, list them for you, and then I want you to listen to them as his poetry flows forth, as his prophecy comes to our ears. The words he uses to describe the suffering servant are pain, suffering, pierced, crushed, oppressed, afflicted, led, not in charge of his destiny apparently at that moment, judged, Cut off, punished, assigned. The Lord caused him to suffer and made him an offering. Now listen to Isaiah. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. I think Isaiah got that wrong. I think we're not sheep. It's more like herding cats. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. As a sheep before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. 
Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand after he has suffered. He will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. That's us. I want to focus this on one phrase in this, though there are many great ones. After he had suffered, verse 11, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. So what happens when the light goes out of your life? What happens when you stand in the midst of suffering and pain and difficulty and depression and everything seems hopeless and all seems lost and everything you've loved and everyone you've cared about seems to have suffered or gone or died or abandoned you. Whatever your story, wherever in the spectrum of life you find yourself, what Jesus brings to the equation in the resurrection and in the prophecy of Isaiah is after he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. Darkness has fallen upon the earth, but the light is coming. Death reigns as he sleeps this Sabbath day, but the resurrection morn is a coming. It is the light of life and the hope of life and the satisfaction that we have to look forward to. Our psalmist says it this way, in God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in God I trust and am not afraid. What can man do to me? I'm under vows to you, my God. I will present my thank offerings to you, for you have delivered me from death and my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. In the light of life. It's the opposite of death. It's the opposite of darkness. It's the opposite of stumbling because we cannot see our way. It's the path that's made clear, the path that's been lighted before us. In God I trust and am not afraid, for I know in whom I have believed, and he will deliver me in that day. May the Lord bless you this Easter season and bless you as we contemplate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. For he says this, My peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And now the deacons will wait upon us, for as we have been blessed, so shall we bless.